Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. So let's dive into that, uh, you know, due diligence process a little bit. And, 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 and you know, if we hire somebody like yourself, uh, you know, what that's going to look like, when, you know, when you're going to be involved and, and just that process of what you're looking at through this due diligence process and, and how you all track all these things. Sure. So when you submit your LOI and you're going to, you know, start your due diligence process, uh, before you submit your LOI, you know if you have a pretty good shot at getting this deal, right? So you're you're pretty far along. I, I just ask that you engage us at that point, right? So that we can go, okay, we have this property and we kind of mark it on our board and set up our teams and whatnot to do that. And then um, once you do it, you have your due diligence period. <clears throat> I've seen them as small as 10 days, but you know, up to 30 days, you have to go in there and do it. And so we schedule it within that time frame. And um, we, we need two days to set it up in the software before we show up. So we, we need at least two days notice, right? That, hey, I'm closing, let's go. Um, but it's, it's pretty easy for us to set up on our end. We've, we've automated as much of it as possible, but you know, we need, you know, kind of the stuff we'll need from you are what building numbers and what units are in those building numbers and are they on the first floor or second floor and then what um, floor layout they are. You know, you may have eight, eight different uh, layout types or floor, floor plans for that property and we want to make sure that we have each one of them so that when you get your report, it's as intuitive as possible for you. You know that, you know, floor plan A1 is a 1-1 one, one, and floor plan, you know, A3 is, you know, is a 3-2 and we can show you the report just for those. So if you want to look up, hey, how are my three bedrooms looking? And then you look at which one of those, you can look at the picture report on that. So it, it gives you so many different ways to do it. Um, and look in there if we have that information. So the two days is important there. Um, and on average, it takes a, a four man uh, crew, which is what we send out to do it. Uh, about, they can do 100 units a day. Um, if you have 150 units, we may add six guys to get it done in a day. Um, but typically, we try to stay about 100 units a day and come in and come out. And then you'll have your report within 24 hours. Um, of us wow. finishing with, with drone footage and everything. So we put it all together in there for you. And, and you know, what else is that report going to show us? You know, how is that going to be laid out? You know, I guess give us some, uh, you know, so we can visualize it a little bit. Sure. So with it, it's, it's a interactive report. So you, you, it's in the cloud. It's not some PDF I'm going to send you and you're going to have to flip through every page. So, the great thing about it is if you're a spreadsheet guy, it's a spreadsheet report and you can just look at the spreadsheet report, which is very easy to understand unit, you know, 511 and here's your appliance section of this report. And here's what needs to be done. Here's what's good, bad or needs replacement um, or it's missing. Right. So you'll even you'll even have those categories categories on there and that goes through every unit, but it blocks the units in on that report also down down in there where your two bedrooms are together, your three bedrooms together, your one bedrooms are together, um, or every floor plan type if you have several different uh, floor plans of each. So it, it kind of breaks it up so you can see it that way. And then at the bottom bottom, it gives you, hey, you need 23 dishwashers on this whole property. You need, you know, 14 microwaves, you know, that are missing um, or need replacement. And on this, on the other section of this report, which is the cost replacement report, it gives you the price that's associated with those, right? So we put in there, you know, a dishwasher is 600 bucks to replace one. Um, and I'm just making up a number here, but you know, $600 to replace one and then it extrapolates, you know, 24 times six and you know, it spits out your number. Same thing with refrigerators and all the other stuff that's, you know, categorized like that. One thing you need to know is we price it in a way that if you have to replace one, the number works, or if you have to place 24, it's gonna be high, it's gonna be on the high side. And the reason we do that is because we don't know going in how many need to be replaced. So just be aware of that. We're doing it to protect you guys, not us, so. 
Nice. Nice. So, you know, help us, you know, if, if we don't have somebody like yourself, you know, let's give a few tips as far as, you know, when we're walking a unit, maybe some things, you know, that you're looking at or that you're, you know, like you already mentioned this, a couple of things that specifically take photos of, or maybe a few things that are commonly missed that you all find, you know, that, you know, as that I might not know to look for when I'm doing my walkthroughs. So we start at the front door. It's, it's kind of very systematically approach. We take the front door, um, look at front door conditions, if it needs to be replaced or not, the, the light at the front door. Um, and then as you walk in, we look at the, the flooring in the entryway. We look at um, what's behind the door. You know, has the door knocked holes in the wall and nobody's ever fixed it, right? So, and then we look at um, smoke detectors, which... Um, we hit every smoke detector and make sure it's working or not. And, and that instantly tells you if they're really maintaining the property, honestly, because tenants will never replace the battery. <laughs> so if, if you as a sponsor want to make sure your smoke detectors are working, we recommend every six months going in and just as a system for your property, replace all batteries every six months um, because it helps you maintain your property and make sure that if there is a fire, then people are woken and it's, everybody knows, but we look at fire extinguishers. We look at, um, air filters for the, for the HVAC system. Are they replacing those nor, you know, regularly or are they just caked on with old muck that's been there a while. Um, we look at sink faucets. Is there a, is there a leak in the kitchen in the bathroom? Um, one of the cool things that we added after is we take a picture of every toilet. And the reason we do that is if you're going to go on water conservation, you need to know if it's a low flow or not. Well, typically we all know these days if it's a one and a half or a three gallon flush versus a 0.8, right? So um, we take a picture to let you know. And just because they do it in a few doesn't mean they do it everywhere. So we take a picture of every one so that you can actually go into the report, look at the pictures of all the toilets on the whole property and see, and you can dial through and it will label, this is in unit 511, this is in unit 512, and you can see which ones have been replaced and which ones haven't. So it's really getting that detail and being consistent with your team on making sure that you're getting all the pictures and all the detail that you want. Nice. So, you know, the team that you send out to do this, this due diligence process, uh, are they, are, you know, someone on the team going to be an expert, let's say in HVAC or roofs or, you know, foundations, all these different components. I know, you know, early on when I started uh, investing in real estate, I hired a, a crew or I hired a, a one man to come out. It was a, a smaller multifamily property. And, you know, I just assumed that he knew all this stuff, right? You know, that I just assumed that he was an expert in all these things. And, and, and lo and behold, he was not. And, and so I didn't get, you know, there was, there was information specifically about like the HVAC units that I learned the hard way, you know, months later that I should have known, you know, before we actually closed on the property and, and felt like, you know, that, I, you know, he should have found it during that due diligence process. So, you know, tell me about that team and, you know, or am I going to have to hire somebody else that's also an HVAC guy or what, you know, what do I need to think about when I'm hiring somebody like yourself or, you know, somebody else? So that's a great question. Um, we're very knowledgeable, but we're not experts on every aspect of this, of this deal. So if you want plumbing line scoped, we're not going to scope them ourselves. We're going to bring on a plumber that can scope your lines and give you video and audio of what the shape the lines are in. And that's an additional cost there. However, on the electrical side of things, if you take a picture of the panel and they have GFCIs in the bathrooms and the kitchens, you know, they've done some wiring work and things are up to date or not, right? So if they're there, they've done some work, if it's an older property, if it's not a stab lock or um, federal Pacific panel, you know that you're probably in pretty good shape on the electrical side. Now, the big push right now is for the HVAC, right? Is it R22 or is it 410 on the, on the Freon? And obviously most of these older properties, they've done some replacements, but not all. And so, with that, we take a picture of the, the condensing unit or condenser unit on the outside and we mark as best as we can, depending on the location, what unit that belongs to. So if that unit belongs to unit 510 and it has R22, we circle it and we say it's functional if it's working, but 
you'll know that it's R22, right? So we try to give you all that detail that we can give you. Now, if it's 410, we'll mark it as good because typically those are in good running shape. Uh, some of you guys may or may not know R22 is going away at the end of the year and um, those condensing units are going to have to be replaced when they go out. Freon's going away. So there are some Freon's that are replacement for R22 that will work in those units. Uh, but we've been told and we've seen that they're not as efficient. So what happens is they break down and you can't replace a part. So at that point, you're forced to go replace that unit. So you just need to be aware of that when you're doing the, doing due diligence um, and go from there. Foundation, foundation's typically pretty easy. So the guys are, are trained to walk the units, look in, see for foundation issues, and then on the exterior, look for foundation issues. You know, if they've put on vinyl siding and inside has cracks all over the place, you know that they've hidden some, uh, some foundation issues. So what we do at that point is if there's some damage that we've found through due diligence, we recommend bringing out a foundation company to come give you an assessment on it. And, you know, depending on the market, we have lots of foundation companies we work with that will come out and give you a free assessment and just say, Hey, this is where we're at. Or, Hey, we need to get an engineer out here to give you the real, real issue. <clears throat> and engineers can be expensive, but they also can save you a lot of money. Um, you know, some people are like, I don't want to go through the expense of hiring an engineer. I said, well, you have foundation issues and I'll throw a, a number at you to give you an idea of what that is. But if you spend, you know, a couple thousand dollars to have an engineer come out here, they're going to give you what really needs to be replaced. And it may be half of what I'm telling you. So, um, it's just a, a case by case on that. So my team, uh, we have a lead that's on the team. And that's going back to what you said. We have a lead that's on the team that's that's trained in looking at all these things in detail, looking at the roof, looking at everything. And we try not to get on a roof. We fly a drone around the roofs, take some close pictures, take an overall picture to give you an idea of what that looks like. And uh, if we see trouble spots, we'll fly down and we'll take a closer picture. So um, that's kind of how we uh, assess the roofs. And then, um, you know, the lead will walk all the exteriors because they're the most trained on, on looking for that. And then we have the other guys that are truly going through the software systematically. Um, uh, you know, you probably know this as well as anybody, the, the younger guys really know how to work technology and they know how to look at the detail and take the pictures and do this and do that. And so all of our guys that do this um, are, are pretty young and, and we keep it that way. I'd say they're all, you know, early twenties in most cases here, um, that go out. If it's, um, a customer that's looking to do, you know, some construction and they need some advice on that. I typically go out with them on at least one day and walk with the, walk with the sponsor and say, Hey, why don't you think about adding a pergola? Why don't you think about adding an outdoor kitchen and really enhance this property so that you kind of come out of there having a good idea of what you're going to do when you're done. We're going to talk about due diligence today and maybe some, some items that, that you know, you've walked through and, and learned about due diligence on some specific properties, and then we'll move on from there. Um, Absolutely. Get us started. Yeah, so, um, so I, well, we've, we've had an interesting track record, and um, uh, we got started in super small real estate, you know, duplexes and, you know, singles, and as you had said, and then we slowly scaled into larger multi- um, you know, we've even syndicated, uh, with investors, small deals as well. And I find that the due diligence process, um, changes a bit as you get into larger multi, but in some ways it also stays the same, um, in a lot of ways. There's just, there just becomes more to look at. Um, but in some ways you're also, you're just really looking at a lot of the same things just on a larger scale. Um, when you take on a bigger multifamily. So, so from a, that's, that's great. So from a small multifamily to a large, you know, what is, what are, what is something we should be thinking about as far as how due diligence would change other than just the scale? Well, let's talk about why, before we even go, let's talk about why we do due diligence as investors, right? Like I, the, the reason why I think, you know, this is like the, you know, I, I give a lot of Matt Faircloth definitions, right? So don't call me Daniel Webster. I'm not the definition guy. I just have my interpretations of what things mean. The reason why my interpretation of why we do due diligence is to validate. It's to validate that things are what I thought they were. So I made my offer on a property and I wrote up a contract on a property based on a certain performance that I thought the property was. Um, and so 
um, my, during due diligence, my job is to go in and validate that the property really is what I thought it was and that the condition really is what I think it is and to make sure that things are not um, swept under the rug, maybe intentionally by the seller, but let's not even get into accusations on that. Let's just say that maybe they're just things that I, weren't, that I was not aware of. Um, you know, uh, I'll give a quick example. I'm sitting here in North Carolina right now. We, we own a property in Fayetteville. I'm here in Fayetteville now. Um, uh, or as they say here, Fayetteville. And so I'm here in Fayetteville and, uh, we bought a property, 198 units. We were told that the property had aluminum wiring in one side of the complex. Okay. I was told that. And so during due diligence, I, I need to I need to evaluate the property knowing that that aluminum wiring is there. Now, if I were to buy a property and not be told that there was aluminum wiring in one side of the complex, then I could, you know, perhaps change the valuation. Um, we can talk about retrading in a second here, of course. Um, but it changes what the property is because there's aluminum wiring. I was not aware of that. There is certain insurance requirements that come along with aluminum wiring. There are certain maintenance requirements that show up around aluminum wiring. Um, but because it was disclosed to me, then I, I'm not saying I can't, but I'm saying to do the right way, to do things the right way in this business, you really only can, can change your plan for things that weren't disclosed. And the purpose of due diligence is really to get the full picture that it is um, on the property. It, the purpose of due diligence is really not to retrade. It's not to get a better deal. Some people view it that way. Um, but it's, it's not to try and an opportunity to haggle. Um, it's, it's an opportunity to make sure that what you're buying is what you thought. And that plays for big and small real estate. Now, I, I like how you talked about the purpose of due diligence is not to retrade. Uh, and also, you know, they, they, they told you about the aluminum wiring. So you're not going to go in there and say, oh, it's got aluminum wiring. We're not interested now. I right. Or to say, well, you know, that aluminum wiring is actually going to make my insurance premium go up. And so I'm going, and that's going to make my cash flow go down. And so I'm going to reevaluate the, the, the property based on that. And they, 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 they very likely can say, listen, man, we told you that it had aluminum wiring. You should, when you made your offer, you should have evaluated it based on the aluminum wiring that you already were told was there. So no thank you. Will you be making an offer based on, um, will you be adjusting the, the price based on that? And we would not accept any price adjustments. If I were the seller, no, you were told. So, so you, you, mentioned, you mentioned retrading. Let's just take, for instance, they didn't tell you, you know, about the aluminum wiring, then you went in, you know, what would happen then? Well, okay. What a retrade is, and it kind of gets a bad connotation because people are like, oh, you never retrade or whatever. Um, it's just really just a revaluation and saying like, okay, under my analysis, I thought the property is worth X. You know, let's just say that's, you know, five million bucks. I thought the property was worth five million bucks based on my evaluation. And so that is my offer to you for the property based on my business plan, based on what my investors want to see, based on what I think the market's going to do, based on all my factors and all my parameters, I'm willing to pay X for that property. Then I do due diligence and I discover that maybe utilities were higher than I thought, or maybe um, I'll give you another example. This property is in a floodplain. You didn't tell me that, you know, and then during my due diligence, I discovered that it is. Now, that is something that it takes maybe 30 seconds to discover <laughs> whether or not properties are in floodplains. Um, and that's so I would submit that you should look at that before you make an offer. But hey, um, let's pretend you didn't find that out till, uh, till contracts. You probably would be turning yourselves in is not doing very good homework. But let's just say that's something that comes up. Then, okay, my, that increases my expenses because of flood insurance or increases my expenses because of the insurance premium that shows up because of that aluminum wiring. Right? Maybe that's a better example. Whatever it is, my expenses go up. My, my net operating income on the property goes down. Um, we've already agreed upon a cap rate. That's what I made the offer based on um, uh, for, the, for the marketplace. Uh, that, that I've got my cap rate in mind for the property. And so let's just say it's a seven. And uh, so I apply that cap rate to the new NOI that the property now will perform under based on that new expense line. And that changes the price. And it's okay. Well, now my new valuation of the property is this. It's really a revaluation versus a retrade. And it's saying, based on the information that just showed up, my new evaluation is X on this property. Um, some people view retrading as a buyer trying to, um, you know, squeeze the seller to beat a, to, to get a better deal out of the seller. Um, and, like and part of the negotiation almost, but it's a negotiation. 
and it shouldn't be. It should be right. just a just a tactic that, that that's there just to make sure that you're getting what you thought you were going to get. That's it. Hmm. You I know? like that. Um, and and it's uh, too many people. And again, I'm I've got a smaller asset that I'm selling right now in um, in Trenton. A uh, guy sent me an offer today, and he overinflated his expenses. He just his evaluation was extremely conservative. Like I'll give you an example. In his underwriting, he showed that he was going to get a seven point five percent interest rate on his mortgage. And I and I just said, listen, that's that that's not what financing rates are on that size property. You can do better than that. Right. And so he's trying to show me like, well, my cash on cash is going to be this. I'm like, well, it's actually not because I'd be willing to bet you you're, you're going to get better than 7.5%. So um, there are games that some people like to play during due diligence by inflating the effect of, of things that come up. Yeah. That's a game. And if anybody on the other side of the deal is savvy, be that the broker or the seller, they will see through the game that you're trying to play. Um, and on the broker side, you're in a reputation with somebody, with somebody who tries to play games on sellers um, to, to, get, to get a better deal on the property. I mean, just offer what you think it's worth and, and don't try and offer one thing and know that you're going to try and retrade to the number you really want to land at because um, you, you get a bad reputation doing that. Um, and then you could very easily tick the seller off and they could just, unless they're in distress, they'll just you know, say, nope, take it off the market or I'm not going to sell it to you. Go to the next buyer. Yeah. Yeah. So what about uh, some kind of checklist? Do you all use checklists for this, you know, due diligence process or how, how did you come up with one if you do? We do. Um, we had one for smaller properties. We've just expanded on it for larger properties. Um, there is due diligence that we do, um, which is we do financial due diligence. So let's, um, you know, we, we do an analysis and underwrite the deal before we make the offer, of course. But then once we um, are under contract, we go and validate the numbers that we have. Okay, let's audit all the leases. Let's, um, you know, send me 18 months, 24 months worth of financial statements on the property. Send me every 24 months worth of utility bills. Um, you know, and so you audit all those financials um, with if you and your team are going to just compare that the seller said, okay, my monthly electric bill was $5,000. Well, you're going to audit the actual utility bills to see if you find the average was $7,000. Okay. We have a difference in, in, um, in expenses. And you know, that's a conversation. Let's find out why that is. Let's find out why they told us five, where they get that $5,000 from. And maybe it opens you up with questions first and then not immediately retrading, but cause maybe they can give you some, some a better explanation. But so that's the financial evaluation. Are, are those documents going to be something that's, that's pretty available or is that going to be per seller? Um, or is that going to be, uh, you know, or exactly what are you going to be asking for? I know you said utilities. I mean, it depends on the seller, right? It's, if you've got a professional broker, um, they will, like I've had most brokers trying to assemble a Dropbox for you, like a, like a Google Drive or a Dropbox that as soon as you're under contract, they just, here you go, here's your Dropbox with everything in it. Um, that's with a seller that has their act together. If it's a professional seller that knows what they've, that, that it runs a tight ship, then they'll easily be able to produce all that. And if they get a professional property management company, they can just upload what they have already right. up into that Google, up into that Google Drive or Dropbox and off you go. Um, are, are bank okay. statements something you normally get? No, no, I'm not normally not willing to give it to you. Yeah. I've asked for it. I've asked for schedule E's on their tax returns. Never been able to get that. We, we always ask for it, but you know, the schedule E is where the real estate income and expense gets listed on a, on a tax return for smaller real estate. Um, you know, it's something to ask for, but it's on my checklist, but we never get it because they always say, no, I'm not going to give you that. Um, never gotten a bank statement ever. We ask for it. They never give it. Um, uh, they, the, we ask for things like a tra something called a trailing 12. Um, and a trailing 12 is the profit and loss statement broken down by month over the last 12 months, um, printed out in the sellers, whatever software they use, you know, QuickBooks, Rip Manager, Yardy, whatever, um, printed out in those softwares. Um, your rent roll, uh, all that, that, that stuff's pretty easy to get. It's, it's right. the, um, some or another people always tend to choke on the last 12 months or 18 months or 24 months worth of utility bills. I don't know why, but they tend to have a problem producing that. Um, maybe they don't keep it or vendor invoices, like a, the bill from their landscaper or whatever. Like we like to validate that kind of stuff. So I want to see every invoice that any contractor ever sent you for work that you did at the site for the last 12 months. That's what I want to see. 
We hope that you have enjoyed the highlight show today. You can always listen to the full episodes that were featured today by clicking the links in the description box. Let us know in the comments what you thought of this episode, or you can go to lifebridgecapital.com forward slash podcast and click the feedback button. Let us know how we can add more value to you. Thank you and talk to you tomorrow. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.